Frank, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. I am so thrilled to have you here to help me solve the riddles of life. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I would start with maybe some, some common ground. And it relates to a book called Built to Scratch. So the background, personally speaking, is that Built to Scratch, along with a few other books, have traveled with me for more than 30 years now. Wow. So they helped wow. set me on my first entrepreneurial journey step and have traveled from house to house, apartment to apartment, country to country ever since. And in the course of doing research, I had read that when you became the CEO of Home Depot, that you had read passages from Built to Scratch. Right. And I was curious if you recalled any of that, why you chose to do that. If you could walk us through it, that would be fantastic. Uh, first, your research is great. Absolutely right. Uh, that's very exciting that the book <laughs> is important to you. As you'll hear, it's hugely important to me. First, the book is uh, the story of Home Depot. Mm -hmm. uh, it was written by Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank and about Bernie and Arthur and Ken Langone and their founding of Home Depot. It's one of the great entrepreneurial stories of our century of our times because Bernie and Arthur had been fired from their prior job. Ken Langone said to them when they got fired, you just got hit by a golden horseshoe in the ass. You're so lucky. <laughs> and then they went and established the Home Depot, which was uh, the most successful retail concept of its time. Fastest to 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion, 40 billion. Uh, my connection with the book is, is it's very meaningful to me, not only because it's the story of the founding of the Home Depot, but also because of my start as the CEO of Home Depot. Uh, I did not have a background that would lead anyone to think that I'd ever be the CEO of the Home Depot. In fact, when the board called me and said, we want you to be the CEO, uh, I said, you ought to take a day and think about this because you, I, while I had been at Home Depot for a few years, I had not been really doing a lot of the retail work. I'd been doing M&A activity and real estate and that kind of thing. And I said, you ought to spend a day, think about it, and think about hiring a real retailer. And I need to think about it. Obviously, they called back at the end of the day. They still offered me the job. I obviously took the job. But I can honestly say that a nanosecond before the call, I was not thinking, I'm going to be the CEO of this company. There were no moments of driving along in the dark of night thinking, oh, what would I do if I were running this place? I was completely <laughs> unprepared. And then, like a lot of retailers, you know, we have a way of communicating to our associates. At the time, Home Depot had around 350,000 associates. We have little uh, TV that we beam in messages to the break rooms. And I have to go and address the 350,000 associates, um, being singularly unprepared. At the time, my, my son, uh, Home Depot has a program of returning veterans, uh, giving them jobs in the store. My son was a returning Iraq veteran, Iraqi war veteran, had come back, had been an assistant store manager, was now a store manager at Home Depot. And so I gave him a call, and I said, Frank, he's the same name as I, uh, I said, Frank, do you have any thoughts on what I should say? And first he said, wow, Dad, good luck. And then the, <laughs> second, the second thing he said was, I don't know what you should say, but I can tell you how I start every store meeting in my store. And I said, great, what do you do? And he said, I take Bill from scratch, and I read from it. I'll read a passage from it. And I go, this is brilliant. And so I pick up the book, I flip madly through it to find something that I think is relevant. And in the book, they talk about the inverted pyramid and a leadership concept where the CEO is at the bottom and the customers and the frontline associates are at the top. And so I use that uh, reading from Built from Scratch and the inverted pyramid as my first communication to our associates. And then for the next eight years as CEO, uh, I spent time figuring out what does that actually mean? Uh, how do you lead from an inverted pyramid um, 
perspective and and what are the leadership lessons you pull from that so yes a uh, hugely important book it's a great book uh unfortunately it's out of print but i'm sure i can get it for anybody who wants it yeah maybe we can get the publisher to do a yeah. reprint. Yeah, that would be great that would I'll be give great them a, give them a right. heads up when this is gonna right. land right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so I'd like to start right in the middle of the action, kind of in media rest with something yeah. like that, and then rewind the clock. So if we go back to your childhood, could you tell us a bit about where you grew up and how you would describe your childhood? Uh, I grew up in uh, right outside of Boston, Massachusetts, a family of five. Uh, I was the fourth of five. Uh, unfortunately, my three older siblings have died. My mom, though, just had her 100th birthday wow. and still lives in the house I grew up in. Uh, had a great, very family-oriented experience growing up. Very close family. And we have a lot of relatives in the area, so New England's sort of home still. What did your mom do for her 100th birthday? Uh, so we had a big party. Yeah. And, and we had lots of relatives, lots of her friends. Uh, she um, She's the kind of person who, if you say... Uh, mention any name, she will know exactly what that person's father did, what their sister did. She'll have a backstory that will go on for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, she works the phone constantly. She did that growing up, and she's done that even to the age of 100. She's sharp as a tack. Wow. So yeah. factual recall. Yeah. Very, very good. And very storytelling. So you just, you go, wow, I had no idea that there was that much interesting going on in their life. You know, they had a twin sister, and the twin sister ran away with the grocery man, and, you know, it was just all that kind of detail. Fascinating stuff. What did you think you were going to grow up to be when you were in, say, high school or uh, uh, when you were younger? I, I was interested in politics. So, so um, I worked on campaigns. Uh, when I got out of college, I worked in the state legislature in Massachusetts. Uh, after I went to law school, I then ended up in Washington, D.C. I had a very traditional uh, Washington, D.C. lawyer government career, moved back and forth uh, from private practice and into the government. So the, I, politics fascinated me. I was interested Why in politics. Why did it fascinate you? What's, what led to that? Uh, or what about it? I think you start you start by by uh, the issues are so interesting. Uh, you think you can impact people's lives. Um, there, uh, it you know, power is a fascinating thing, and yeah. so politics is a source of power, and it's fascinating because of it. Did you experience conversations about politics over the dinner table, or how were you introduced not a bit. to it? Not a bit. Not a bit. No, not a bit. Uh, yeah. It was entirely. Um, I self-generated. I don't know where it came from, but it, yeah, just <laughs> no one else in my family was remotely interested in politics. That okay. was my thing. So as I was mentioning before we started recording, I've had a hell of a time trying to figure out what path to take with this conversation because you have such an eclectic background and uh, people will have heard certainly a fair amount of this in the introduction, but I'll just mention a few things, and then I'll get to the question. So you have law clerk for Supreme Court Justice, general counsel for GE. I'm skipping a lot. Deputy secretary. Now, do you say deputy secretary of the Department of Energy, or is it better to just say deputy secretary of energy? Department of Energy. There we go. Uh, yeah. All right. And then CEO of Home Depot, and then certainly, at least as one of our mutual friends has put it, you are the least retired retired person he knows. <sighs> I have a lot of friends who are lawyers, loved yeah. ones who are lawyers, yeah. uh, former lawyers, and they tend to be very uh, certainty focused and uh, averse to entrepreneurship. So how have you, and if this is even accurate, ended up with this combination of very strong legal background and ability to manage in amidst uncertainty and combine those two. It's really unusual from my experience, at least. Uh, I'm probably an awful lot accidental. Uh, so the first part accidental was a group of us set up our own law firm. So there are 12 of us who set up our own law firm. And that was kind of my first experience with entrepreneurial activity. And I could say I was singularly bad. I The firm did great. Uh, 
most of my instincts about how to do it, actually looking back are pretty funny because I was wrong. Uh, so that was an introduction to entrepreneurial activity. Uh, I left Washington uh, to go to GE to be the general counsel of a business in Schenectady, New York, and everybody thought that's the stupidest thing we've ever heard. Why would you leave Washington, a great legal practice, and go to Schenectady? And mostly it was, by that time I was kind of sick of politics and sick of Washington. And uh, I was the beneficiary of the way GE did HR. So the, uh, basically they moved people around every 18 months. But they never bothered to move the lawyers because, you know, they're not going to bother to move the lawyers. So after about five or six years, I'm the person around the table who sort of knows how the business works. And I've listened to this and I've observed over time. And uh, they offered me a job going on to the business side and then the rest of it. Um, I, being a lawyer is great. Uh, Having been a lawyer is even better. So, so I, really, I really enjoyed the business side and found it much, much more fascinating than the legal side. Uh, how did you make the decision, walk us through making the decision to leave the law practice and take the job at GE? Because that's a scary, or it could be a scary step. And I know certainly looking around myself at my friends who have yeah. what most people would consider successful legal careers... Uh, they often pine after these types of changes, but very right. few of them actually take the leap. So how did you, uh, how did you make that decision? Uh, there were two things. The first, the first, just as a scene setter, is it is the case I have never made as a salary more money than I made as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I did more with my draw from a law firm than through to being CEO of the Home Depot. So it was, it was a very good legal practice. The problem with a legal practice, after a while that you realize, is um, there's such a disincentive for any kind of efficiency, mm -hmm. right? Somebody right. comes in with a problem and you go, I know this problem, right. I can name this tune in three notes. Yeah. Well, no, actually, that's not what you, <laughs> that's not the <laughs> business model. You want to say, oh boy, that's a complex symphony. That's going to be 3,000 <laughs> notes. And so the idea of trying to do something that's cumulative rather than uh, billing your time by the hour is really what appealed to me. And so, and, and Washington's a very, um, Washington's a very closed little culture. Yeah. And I wanted just to get out of, out of that close culture. And Schenectady, New York sounded like the far end of the earth. Now, at the time, were you single, married? When married. You, you're married. Married. How did that, uh, how did you deliver the news? Or how did you discuss the possibility of that switch? Uh, I, you know, if I, you're comfortable saying. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that we had a lot of discussion around it, but it was clear that I was not. I just was becoming increasingly unhappy uh, on the legal side. And while I'm, I'm not sure everybody was thrilled, I, and my family wasn't thrilled to be moving to, uh, it, you know, we lived in Albany, but to be moving to upstate New York, they rode in with it. Gets chilly. I grew up in New York, but on, All right. on Long Island. But All upstate right. gets chilly for people up, who haven't up, been there. Upstate is chilly, and um, yeah, <laughs> it's very chilly. Uh, GE. So GE is another company in addition to Home Depot, even though I've never done anything right. myself in any industries related to either that is fascinating. Yes. To me. Uh, when did you first meet Jack Welch? Oh, early, early on. Um, and, and, and then I ended up as a direct report for Jack. Uh, I, Jack Welch is, I mean, the founders of Home Depot, uh, Bernie Marcus, Ken Langone, Arthur Blank, they're extraordinary people. Jack Welch is an extraordinary, extraordinary human being. W one of the ways I would describe it is I would never take a phone call from him sitting down. The energy just immediately you stood up to provide an answer to Jack and uh, just... I've got a lot of, he was hugely helpful to me while I was the CEO at Home Depot. Got a lot of stories around Jack, truly a, well, a hero. Yeah, let's get into it. This is a long form podcast, so we, have, right. we have the luxury of time. All right. so, so, so this is an arc. This is a, uh, 
so I become CEO of the Home Depot. I think, uh, all right, I'm going to call Jack and I'm going to ask him for some time and kind of give me CEO 101 lessons, and which I did. And he was very nice. He was down in Florida at the time. I said, Jack, can I spend a day with you and you know, kind of pick your brains? And he said, great. And mind you, I have done hundreds of pitches to Jack in my time at GE. And I prepared so hard for this meeting with him. I could tell you the margin rate of an ant trap. I mean, I was just into <laughs> all the details, all the numbers. And I go down, and the first thing he says is, um, draw me your org chart. And we spend a day going through people. And it was probably one of the most helpful days of my time because, you know, and I recommend this for anybody, anywhere, if you find somebody that you really respect who will ask you questions and then you just listen to what you're saying. And in effect, he did that uh, for me on the organization and the people. And then every year, I do the same thing. I'd spend a day with Jack every single year. And this is jumping ahead, but I love the story so well, we much. We can jump around. So the eighth year, so my last time, I get to ask the question that's sort of the moron, stupid question that you wouldn't dare ask earlier because you wouldn't be able to get the next meeting with Jack. So I go, okay, Jack, all of the attributes of leadership, if, if you had to weigh them all and pick one, what is the single most important attribute of leadership? And his answer shocked me. Uh, he said, generosity. And I wouldn't have predicted it. It kind of took me by surprise when he said it, and then when he explained it, and explained how, as leaders, you need to be fueled by the success of others, and how that's really got to be the driving force. And I could see that as true for how he ran GE. Um, it made a lot of sense, and it stuck with me ever since. It was a great lesson. Why was it important in that first meeting that he shifted the focus to the org chart? What happened? What were the questions he asked? What were the important? So the great questions were, uh, first, how are you organized? I right. mean, because you know, that tells a lot about what your priorities are. And second, uh, he'd be asking about people, and I'd be, I'd find myself in some instances kind of making excuses and saying, well, you know, blah, 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 but not really. And then he'd just say, I mean, did you hear what you just said? What are you going to do about it? And it wasn't his commentary on these people. He didn't even know them. Okay. But listening to his, you know, feeding back to me what I was saying and then say, hey, look, you know, you're not smart enough to do this on your own. So if you're going to do this and be successful, you gotta you got to get the right team with you. So. For people who don't know Jack, what would you say he is best known for? Uh, I mean, something that uh, stuck with me, and I have great respect for Jack, and I've read a lot about him, but I might be getting the details wrong because it's been a while. Uh, I mean, he's had the nickname Neutron Jack. He, I think it was with the bottom 10% yeah. of performers yeah. in GE were yeah. let go yeah. on an annual basis. Yeah. annual basis. And was he then asking you about strongest, weakest performers and then asking you why you were keeping or why the weakest performers were continuing <laughs> to be employed? So he wasn't doing it on a kind of percentage, tell me who, you know, who lags and who's ahead. It was more individual by individual. Tell me, describe for me their strengths and weaknesses, go through it. Um, and what I would say, the, what Jack did that um, particularly impresses me in retrospect because it's so hard to do. Um, so I'm, I go into GE as a lawyer. Uh, GE is a finance engineering firm. Lawyers are not, I mean, you know, we had a great legal team, uh, but it still, the lawyers are not at the top of the organizational pecking order. Somehow, Jack got the sense within me that the path to success in the company was actually to disagree with him and be right. And that's huge. Because 
and he would say this, uh, you know, I'd, I'd express, wow, that's so amazing, you know, in retrospect, Jack, that's so amazing. And he'd say, well, I really don't need to pay people to tell me I'm right. <laughs> I need to pay people who are going to tell me where I'm wrong. But organizations are such echo chambers. And Bernie Marcus gave me a great piece of advice. He gave me tons of pieces of advice that were terrific. But I've, I remember one of them at the start of becoming CEO. Bernie said, okay, let me tell you how this works. You're going to be sitting around a table, and you're going to tell a joke, and all the folks are going to laugh. And he said, let me tell you, you're not funny. <laughs> and the point, of, the point of that is, you know, people are just going to respond to you the way they think you want them to respond. So eliciting the kind of reaction that Jack did for me, which was, hey, it's okay actually to disagree with the boss. You damn well better be right. But it's a good thing to disagree with the boss. It's huge. So on that point, uh, and I may get the pronunciation yeah. wrong, uh, Carol Tomei, yeah. so at the time Home Depot's CFO, yeah. has said that still. when you arrived, still, yeah. and this is a compliment, yeah. that you invited <laughs> conflict into the decision-making process. Uh, and, and I'll quote here, this is from a Fortune article. We were conflict hesitant. Frank asked a ton of questions that make you say what is working and not working. So this is interesting to me. Uh, how do you encourage people and to disagree and elicit right. the bad news or whatever it might be? How do you do that without also simultaneously or dissipating the fear of getting punished for that? I. Uh I think it's one of the most important things. So, so I have a long discussion around what the inverted pyramid means. But mm -hmm. one of the things it means is that everything that's important, as the CEO, everything that's important is happening above you with the customers and the frontline associates and the folks who you know, work in the organization. So you've got to figure out a way to effectively listen and effectively get them to communicate to you. I learned actually from a board member at Home Depot, and this may be more unique to retail to doing this, but it worked, uh, that the best way to do that is if I was walking in a store and we had a particular project, my comment would be, why isn't Project X working? And then they'd go, oh my gosh, Frank knows that the project isn't working. I guess we better say something. And so that would actually prompt a conversation. While if you said, how's everything going, in any organization of any size, there's only one right answer when the boss says, how's everything going? The answer is, it's going great, you're awesome, please go. And you need to kind of pull out from people. You know, every once in a while, somebody would say, why do you say it's not working? It's working great. But more often than not, it would be, oh, well, here's, here's, what you're missing. here's what's not happening, here are the issues. So... so there are so many pieces of paper, as you can see, and so many questions that I want to ask. And uh, the, next, the next one is really closely related to this and uh, something that I think about a lot, uh, and I'll lead into it in a somewhat confusing way, but the internet is almost all negative feedback. People get punished and attacked. However, if you look at, say, operant classical conditioning, dog training, mammal training, human training, positive reinforcement is actually critically important. Uh, so <laughs> this is a, this is a, a quote and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd, I'd love to get some examples of how you have celebrated people's successes and wins, whether within Home Depot or elsewhere. And, uh, the quote is, I'm a lawyer. Lawyers don't celebrate shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, or actually, furthermore, the only way people know what you want is that you celebrate when they get it right. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers don't celebrate shit. So how, how, what are concrete examples of how you would do that? Uh, that was actually one of my biggest learnings of the time as CEO was the importance of celebration. In fact, what I tell people now is, you know, every business person knows the saying that uh, you get what you measure. Mm -hmm. I'd say there's an important, maybe even more important corollary. You get what you celebrate. Mm. People, just as you say, uh, they reference off of the stories. They reference off of when you reward someone and make a point of it. Uh, that actually sticks in the mind long after other things have forgotten. 
And at, uh, at Depot, we did a lot. In fact, spent a lot of time on this. Uh, personally, I would spend every Sunday afternoon writing notes to hourly associates. So for us, customer service was what we were after. Customer service is such a vague, right, such a vague term. And I would write 100 to 200 notes every Sunday. And we had a whole process for rolling up, you know, the Joan, Jane, Jack did blank. And it would roll up from the store to the district to the region. And I would write notes saying, dear Joe or Jane. And it wouldn't just be, you're awesome, thank you very much, Frank. It would be, I heard you did blank, and I'd write out what it was. Thank you very much, and uh, send the note out and sign my name. And there's a, I, I, there's a long, I have a long thing about note writing and why note writing is so well, let's, important. Let's get into okay, it. But, yeah. but so I wondered about the power of that, but early on I was walking a store, and an associate came up to me and said, um, gee, would you mind rewriting the note that you sent me? And I I said, no, sure, no problem, but why? And he said, well, we were all convinced that it was a RoboPen note, and so we put it under water, and it leaked, it ran, and so would you write me another one? Uh, People... People respond to being recognized. I learned this from, so I, early in my career, I worked for George Bush dad when he was vice president. And it's a great thing to work for. I mean, he's a wonderful human being. Working for the vice president is great because it's a very small staff, so you can actually see what he does. And at the time, so this is 1981, ages and ages ago, no computers, but he would come into the office and type out notes. And you knew that he was typing the notes because, you know, the E would be slightly off and the be white out. <laughs> but as a staff member, when you got a note from the vice president, you know, you were walking on water. I mean, you just felt like everything was great. And uh, I believe that we learn more from those positive stories and recognition than anything else. So, in addition, I mean, the notes were kind of my thing, but we also did a video every single week of great customer service, and we put it in that same break room TV. And you'd videotape the actual, the associates yeah. who were We'd being highlighted. Yeah, we'd retell the story. We'd retell the story with the associates. I mean, so there'd be one of these every single week. We did little books of great associate uh, customer service stories. We have, if you go into stores, you'll see people with badges and recognition. And it's, um, it is, you just don't communicate. You can write a memo to someone and think it gets down through an organization, but it doesn't. It's Mm -hmm. when you pull people out and say, here, this is what this person did that was extraordinary. You tell a story around it. And everyone remembers that story. That person's thrilled, and everybody else is going, I want a story told about me too. I'm doing that kind of stuff as well. And it builds on itself. So if you have, I think the number that you mentioned was 350,000 or a few hundred right. thousand. No, 350,000. 350, and now over 400. Right. So if you have 350,000 associates and you're doing this every week, how, what are the check boxes? or the process for selecting those 200. I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. I, because I, I, no doubt there are people listening to this. I know there are people listening to this who run very large organizations. And the, the, that's, that's going to be one of the questions top of mind, I would imagine. So the great thing about it is you take, some, you take that. So you say, Frank wants to send a note out. Then this is where having an organization is great because then you say, okay, here's how we're going to do it. The stores are going to submit stories of great customer service, and the store will submit that to the district, and the district will take its best stories, and the district's best stories go to the regions, and then the regions all submit them to me. So beyond the note writing itself, there's actually a process for recognition. So I hope the better store managers were recognizing every single story that they forwarded on to the district and were making a celebration with their associates in that store. Same with the districts and same with the region so that it reinforced itself. Uh, So it's not just the one note. 
it's the entire process. It's why, as I say, the people just should spend time thinking about what they're recognizing and celebrating. They should do it intentionally. They should have a process around it. They should do it consistently because, you know, we talk a lot about company culture, but that's what really sets the culture. It's what everybody is saying. You want to know, you want to see the story, you want to see what this looks like, this is what it looks like. And so if, if these letters are going out and people want to receive a letter, they want to be in the video, right? Uh, what were the criteria for good stories? In other words, these various, say, district managers and so on could have their subjective views of what makes a good customer service story, but did you give them any guidelines at all? Uh, not, I didn't, I'd right. be honest. I, yeah. I mean, customers, I mean, that's the important thing about customer service is um, it takes lots of different forms. Right. But um, what we weren't looking for is, and it's not like this isn't important, but we weren't looking for the story of the, you know, cashier who stopped the robber. Yeah. I mean, so those are important stories, <laughs> But it, you know, some companies are more focused on shrink prevention and things like that. We were focused on customer service. And we had lots of different, I mean, just emotionally powerful people helping other people in the store. Um, phenomenal, phenomenally strong stories. But no, didn't set any guidelines. So, so you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the ba stopping the bank robbery, not the bank robbery, but the, right. the theft. Right not being a very good example. And what this brings to mind for me is, I think it was Andy Grove of Intel. I might be getting this wrong. I'm sure someone on the internet will correct me if I am. But that for every metric they decided to measure, for which was a positive indicator for the company, Andy would insist that they identify the, sort of per, the perverse incentive or correlating metric that they should measure right. for side effects. Right. And so you could, I mean, I'm reaching a little bit here, but you could see if someone says, this, of course, this is exaggerated, but oh my God, I could get in the video if I stop a robbery. Like who yeah. could I, who could right. I hire to simulate right. a robbery? <laughs> right. uh, and I'll let my buddy go, but I'll put up a right. good fight and get in the video. Yeah. Uh, how did you, you mentioned the, what you, uh, what you celebrate, or I'm sorry, the, let me get this right. I just wrote it down, but, uh, Effectively, you get what you measure, you get what you celebrate. Right. Uh, what were some of the, when you took the reins, what were some of the metrics that, that you focused on or that the organization focused on? Yeah. Uh, so every retailer, I mean, now it's commonplace, but you look at uh, what's called net promoter score. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, I mean, the, if that's an accurate Andy Grove quote, I entirely agree with it because... Um, it's definitely a quote from someone. <laughs> definitely a quote from someone and a right quote because every single metric does have a germ of a problem in it. So you have to be careful. I mean, we would measure net promoter score, you know, how happy the customers are in the store. Uh, but it's always a reminder that the dominant measure is how are we doing on sales and profitability? Mm -hmm. So as you move down below that on the metric side, you have to be very careful. And how did you measure sales? There are many different ways to doing it or revenue. You have revenue per square foot. You have say uh, profit or revenue or net income, whatever it might be per employee. You have many different approaches you could take. Were there any that were more important than others? No. I mean, we, our stores, uh, while they're very idiosyncratic within the box mm -hmm. uh, they're very similar and we just we would look at uh, so we didn't have to get very sophisticated about on the store side on revenue per square foot the merchandising side you do more of that because you'd want to say what's our what's our return on the space we're we're allocating to that merchandise see so you you'd mentioned uh, at least once maybe a few times how you seemed to be the accidental CEO. Didn't expect yeah. to be asked to be CEO. How did they explain it? Or if they didn't, I'm sure they, they probably said something. Why, why were you asked to be CEO? Uh, well, uh, uh, that's 
In the end, you need to ask Ken Langone, who was the lead director and the other directors of Home Depot at the time. I've never really spent time asking them why. Uh, I think they had seen a lot of me because uh, I was in charge of deals. And we did a lot of M&A transactions. The, that was as the SVP, the Senior Vice President of Corporate Business Development, or? Oh, right. no, that was, a, that was at uh, GE. Well, right. I did deals. So my the job I ended up with at GE was uh, doing M&A. The yeah. job I was uh, doing at Home Depot was doing M&A. We went out and we bought uh, a whole series of companies uh, that were called at the time Home Depot Supply that became, that was the largest uh, commercial industrial distributor in the country. The first, but I pitched those deals to the board. So they saw me a lot. And then the first thing I did when I became CEO, I said, we need to sell this business. And we sold the business. Why did you have to sell the business? Or uh, why did you recommend that they sell the business? So um, the dominant reason for me personally was, uh, and I think that this was organizationally right, but I know it was right for me individually, was saying to be the best retailer in any space requires 110% of the effort. For me, to be the best leader of a retailer is 110% plus of effort. No chance that I can also say, oh, and here's this other business, this you know, great commercial industrial distribution business, I can be the best CEO in that space too. Just knew that was not going to be possible. And so said we need to sell. Is that what you said to convince the board that it was a good idea? Or Pretty how? much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And said, and it was, I don't think I made it that personal. Right. I, I think I said, look, because the, the company... We'd been losing uh, market share. Uh, we were trailing our principal competitor. I said, this is, um, we got to be all eyes on the retail business. And we got to get rid of everything that's a distraction of the retail business. Plus, at the time, uh, so I took over right at the start of 2007. And the housing crisis was, you know, by that point, the clouds were fairly obvious. And so we knew we had to make some dramatic changes because things were going to go downhill fast and they went even more downhill and faster oh, than yeah. we anticipated. I bought a house in late 2007. Talk yeah. about good timing. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> in San Jose, yeah. AKA Man Jose, California, but yeah. that's a separate story. Uh, <laughs> the decision to divest of, I guess, HD supply. Yep. And I may be misattributing, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But it it is also makes me think of Jack Welch, if I'm getting this right, which is, did he not want every division or product line or company to be either number one or number two in its category? Or he famously had that as an objective. That did not drive that decision because Home Depot supply was number one. Right. Got it. So, so it's more a matter of focus. So it was a matter of focus. And in fact, a... I mean, my commentary was um, there are some unique individuals like Jack who can run a conglomerate. And I would be deep, deep into the details of the business I worked at in GE, and Jack would still ask questions to me that I'd just slap my head and go, oh, my God, what a great question. Why didn't I think of that? I knew not me. I mean, it would take, <laughs> it would take all, as I said, just... Running a conglomerate is a is a big big challenge, and not one I knew I couldn't do that. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, well, we've we've talked a bit about your legal background, and uh, someone compared you at one point Darwin Smith, the attorney turned CEO at Kimberly Clark, uh, because of how lawyers are trained in conflict, how to navigate deep rooted issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've also noticed that, for instance, if I can't find a proofreader who is a professional writer, I will ask one of my friends who is a lawyer because they're very good. They're not professional proofreaders per se for the type of writing that I do, but they're very good at spotting language that is nebulous, words that shouldn't be there. Uh, how did your legal training help you for what came later? 
and it might be a chicken and the egg thing. I mean, it could yeah. be what helped you to be an, a, a, a good lawyer, but uh, what about those life experiences or that training helped you later or hurt? I think, uh, I think the part of, so the hurt is easier. So we so, can start there. Yeah. So the, <laughs> so the, the things that you, I kind of had to hike away from are, uh, for lawyers, everything is great, right? There, there's, and you can chew over decisions for a long time and it's very complex and full of ambiguity. If you're leading 350,000 people strong and you're calling out and your statements are in paragraphs, I mean, just <laughs> you've lost it <laughs> right from the start. So <laughs> driving for simple, portable messages that just, you know, screw the ambiguity, uh, that is essential. I actually think it's essential regardless of whether it's 350,000 people or three people. So that you kind of have to train away from. The part that's probably good is uh, you're trained to worry. I mean, lawyers are trained. I always felt like... Law school trains you to worry about things that no normal human being would <laughs> worry about. And so there is a value, there is a value as a CEO to worry. And you, but you got to kind of internalize that as much as possible uh, because the other part of you have to get rid of that worry. Colin Powell has a great expression that I deeply believe in, which is optimism is a force multiplier. And in any organization, you got to, and this was particularly true as things were grim, you've, you've got to drive to the optimistic side. You can't be going, oh, you know, God, you know, this really could turn out badly. Uh, so, um, but I think internally that's helpful to worry mm -hmm to be thinking around the corner, to be thinking what's gonna go wrong. Just as you said, get that every metric that you put in place comes with its own little seed of destruction. Understanding that, being aware of it, don't tell it to anybody else. So, you know, we would, all our stores would have net promoter scores. I wouldn't tell them, oh, Here's the fascinating flaw in that metric and right. why you might not want to be committed to that. We just go, this is what we're focused on. We're focused on our net promoter score. So, How there, you, oh, I'm sorry. No. I was going to, uh, I'm going to zoom out, but I want to zoom in for a second just on net promoter score. How did, how did, you, uh, how did you all measure that? It's, it was by surveys in, uh, after on the receipt in the store. And so you can immediately imagine if, so, so, not to get into the nitty gritty yeah, of what's wrong it. with net promoter scores, but you can imagine one of the things is yeah. the more um, crowded your store is, the more volume your store does, by and large, that correlated to a net promoter score that was a little bit lower. Right. If you wanted the highest net promoter score, have a store <laughs> that very few people went to. Uh, right. So one customer per right. employee per day. Right. Exactly. And they were thrilled and they take the little, <laughs> you know, they give, give you the positive feedback. But yeah, we did it straight off of, um, straight off of receipts and people typing in and saying whether they're happy or they weren't happy. And we, then, you know, now on the internet, obviously a lot easier, a lot easier, um, for C surveys come up all the time. It's also a lot easier too, uh, as you noted, uh, get lost in the seeds of destruction right. or the noise, right. right? Because if you have a net promoter score also, at least of, of some types, you can uh, have a selection bias for people who are unhappy, which is super, yep. super yep. tough. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, exactly. But the, the zooming out uh, I want to do right now and look at what you said about keeping, keeping a lot of that worry and potential downside inside. This is a, a huge challenge for a lot of founders and CEOs that I know where they have to really like put on the brave face and help everyone march to optimism while keeping any of the concerns they might have inside, or at least not showing it publicly to all the troops. Uh, could you walk us through if possible, or just describe maybe a, a period or an instance where you had a lot of that to keep inside and how you dealt with that? Because a lot of these CEOs feel really alone. They end up in some cases getting health problems. Uh, it's very, very challenging. Uh, 
could you give us a, maybe an example of, of how you've contended with that? Uh, the best thing for me, uh, there's a, there's a great saying in retail that now has to be amended because of the internet, but the saying in retail is all truth is on the floor of the store. So now it's also online, but mm -hmm. all truth is on the floor of the store. Um, the best vehicle for me to deal with those worries was always spending time in the store. And I would try, I don't think, I didn't do it religiously every week, but I would do um, dinners with hourly associates whenever I, you know, wherever I was, I'd try to do one a week um, with hourly associates. And you pretty quickly get your problems put in perspective. And it was hugely valuable to me. And I remember the first one I did was we fly in and I'm sitting around. There's this very nice woman sitting next to me, you know, kind of give or take my age. And I'm complaining about my back. So I, you know, she says, how are you doing? And I say some, something with my back. Mind you, I've flown in on a private plane. And I'm saying, you know, <laughs> you know I got my back problems. And then I go, how are you? And she said, well, you know, it's funny that you say that about your back problem because, you know, three months ago I fractured my spine and I had to be in traction and it was really difficult when I started working in the store again and I was in a wheelchair. And, you know, we have bulky items and they have to get moved. And I'm going, you know, I'm complaining about the little... And then she says, and I go, wow, that's amazing. And then she said, well, that wasn't the really hard part. The really hard part was... I have a 12-year-old developmentally disabled son, and I had to bathe. Them. I have to bathe him every day, and I have to get him in the bath, and that was so difficult when I was, you know, in the wheelchair. The fears and worries kind of melt when you see what people are putting up with every day, and doing one foot in front of the other, and having a smile, and being, um, you know, committed to people around them. And so that gave a sense of perspective that sort of put the earnings per share worries <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit in farther focus. And they were always great for that. I mean, just amazing. Home Depot and, and both Bernie and Ken, Arthur as well, uh, the great stories of Home Depot. And why Built from Scratch is such a great book, why it's such a great idea is... There's some crazy stories in that book. But, I mean, they're great. They're but just, the underlying yeah. thing is people who, you know, typically start, I come in, I'm shagging carts in a lot. I, you know, maybe I graduated from high school. I'm not really sure why I'm doing this job. And, you know, 80% of our store managers started as hourly associates. Our upper management started as hourly associates. And it's these amazing uh, career stories, wealth generation through starting at the bottom in retail. I was at dinner uh, last week with a friend. This, I think, happens all the time with Bernie and Ken and Arthur. But it was, you know, if you go, boy, there's a bell to ring in life. This guy comes up with, up, and he's with his daughter. And he said, uh, I just wanted to introduce my daughter to you because I want to introduce her to the person who's making her college possible. And you go, wow. I mean, first off, obviously not me, but wow. That's, yeah. That is such an awesome story. And that story is replicated over and over and over and over again at Home Depot. And it was uh, both Bernie and Ken and Arthur always talk about the Home Depot, you know, you have your mission statement and all the rest, but what it's really about is wealth generation for your associates. And it ties back, if, it ties back to Jack's comment about leadership. Mm -hmm. that, that if, if at the end you could say, wow, these people made their lives and careers from it, that provides a great perspective on the job. After leaving Home Depot, since that time, how have you created a pressure release valve for the worrying or uh, stress in so, your life? So uh, the first great thing about retirement is the anxiety level drops. Right. Dramatic. <laughs> so, 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 uh, the, if you were inputs yeah. every day, you know, the, the thing about a retail business is on your phone, 
they're your sales. And the IT organization is saying, gee, I can give you this by the minute. <laughs> and you go, no, I really don't want it. Excuse me. I don't want it by the minute. Um, <laughs> so that anxiety of every day, I mean, Home Depot just uh, reported its results, and they're great results. And uh, Craig Manier is the CEO now, is doing a phenomenal job, but it is that every day, every day pressure on delivery uh, that's good to step away from mm-hmm. and good to think about what are some of the other things you want to do in your life and um, focus some time elsewhere. What else? Uh, what, when it creeps in, is there anything that you like to do, any particular sports or morning routines or anything that you find helpful for managing your state? Uh, there are lots of there are lots of things. Uh, so when because I because I think your retirement is busier than most people's careers in in, <laughs> in some respects. I mean, you 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 certainly keep yourself uh, occupied. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear what what routines or habits are, are critical uh, to you. So the habits are very different now. Mm-hmm. I, I I think probably I had a very non uh, pretty much because of starting without a you know a preset set of notions of what I was going to do at Home Depot. If you ask me what I did at the start of every day as CEO of Home Depot, no, the compare yeah. and contrast. Well, let's, 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 let's do both, All if right. you're okay with that. So, yeah. So the, so, and I'm not recommending this. This is not a good tool. <laughs> but I started every day uh, reading emails from customers. And I did that because... Um, because... In any large organization, it's really easy to get a false sense from averages and percents. Mm-hmm. And then you see, uh, wow, we did that badly. And mm-hmm. it's a good, it was a good marker uh, for me of how we were doing and what we needed to focus on. And that kind of management by anecdote is actually pretty powerful. But I would do that for like an hour early in the morning. I have always gotten up really, really early. What, so I, what time is early? So I get up about quarter of five, mm-hmm. and I'd usually be in the office by six o'clock and you know, start reading emails. Now I don't. I still get up really early. Uh, now instead, uh, I, I start by, by reading. Um, uh, my wife and I, uh, and this was a habit introduced, and I, and um, I'm not, I, I struggle with the notion of an intentional God. My wife does not. My wife is a strong believer in an intentional God, and we pray in the morning together. And uh, it was awkward. You know, I'm a New Englander. That's just, you know, we don't, gosh, we don't do anything uh, with anyone, that, that level of intimacy. And uh, that's actually really an interesting habit to have uh, because saying things aloud and hearing what's in her mind uh, and then you know sort of being forced in yourself okay what what do what am I grateful for what am I seeking help for is is really is really valuable um, so that's a different what, different kind of habit so what is the the format you don't have to share yeah. the, the specifics unless you're open to yeah. doing that but what is the format of of the prayer how long does it last and you mentioned uh, maybe some some sneak peeks but yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear about that because uh, i journal almost every morning yeah and it's i'm not speaking aloud but there there might be some commonalities yeah. uh, no i suspect what is the format that you use so the format is there are there's actually we have there's a lectionary that tells you what readings so there are a series of readings so you do a reading typically from the old testament the psalms and the new testament is typically how you go so we read and then uh we pray and my prayers i've gotten better at it you know because i do think to the extent you write it down or you say things, it kind of gives context and maybe in some way it makes it more likely to happen. Mm-hmm. My prayers have tended to be, you know, hey, hey, I hope everything works out. And boy, am I grateful for everything. And my, <laughs> my wife would be very specific about, uh, and is very specific about, this person needs help. Uh, this is what I'm going to do to try to help this person. My wife, I've... Uh, parenthetically, um, worked for Habitat for Humanity. Mm-hmm. That was her job. And she goes to Haiti nearly every other 
well, every month for a while she's going almost every other week. So she's um, she does a lot for other people, but she will mention here's here are the people who are in need. Here's what and um, so it's really helpful seeing. Okay, that's what she's focused on, and then it teases out for me. What should I be focused on? Who needs help? What should I be doing? So if if people if if someone were transcribing your prayers, would would there be certain categories that tend to pop up more than others, like somebody who needs help and how I'm going to help yeah. them. I'm grateful for X. Yeah. Yep. I need help with X. Are there, are there particular buckets that tend to pop up a lot? It's, it's uh, other people who need help. Uh, we have, there's a separate thing of each time kind of naming two things we're grateful for. Mm -hmm. And what are we grateful for? And it could be, I'm grateful to be on Tim Ferriss' podcast. <laughs> I'm, gra I'm grateful. It's, it's, uh, but it's a, it's a good mental exercise to say, hey, there's an enormous amount of stuff to be grateful mm -hmm. for. And then there are people who need help. And, it's, um, and my wife is a much more powerful prayer than I am, <laughs> but I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting there. I really, I really like that. I don't, I don't pray in the morning, although maybe someone would, uh, would consider what I do a secular <laughs> prayer perhaps, yeah. but I do have a gratitude right. journal. And right. I note you know, three things that I'm grateful for first thing in the morning. And then I have a handful of prompts that take four to five minutes right. in the AM. And then I do a review in the PM, including right. what am I grateful for that happened today effectively. Right. Uh, it's, it's very deceptively powerful. Exactly right. Uh, exactly right. And uh, like, like you mentioned, uh, or maybe I'm implying or inferring, it also helps to develop the lens through which you view the rest of the day, right? Yep. If, if you buy a car and yep. then all of a sudden you go out and you see your car everywhere, it's not because everyone went out and copied you and bought your car. It's because right. you have yep. that attuned selective attention. Yep. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really powerful. Uh, and it's a powerful way to get to l learn about another person too. Mm -hmm. So to get that sense of, oh, okay, you know, this is what they're worried about. This is how they think. It's really useful. I really love that it starts with somebody else who needs help and then grateful for yeah. in, in the sense that it's not right off the bat beginning with your ask. Right. Right. That's really important. Yep. Uh, you mentioned checking or reading customer email. So I had read on, I think it was consumerist.com. It's probably elsewhere, but you gave out your phone number and email <laughs> And uh, I think that uh, this, is, this is the line that I found on Consumerist. Use it if you have a persistent problem with Home Depot that hasn't been resolved through normal customer service channels. Remember to be polite, professional, and to the point. And then there's a phone number extension, da 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 da, da. You can also email you know, then yeah. frank underscore blake at homedepot.com. Yeah. How on earth do you triage that? Did, did you get fewer email than expected, fewer phone calls? Did you get deluged? What happens when a you lot. do Yeah. A lot. There are a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have a team. Uh, I mean, I think it was hugely important to do. I did it early on. I still get customer emails, uh, but we set up an executive resolutions team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not... Uh, I learned, I learned the first weekend on the job when I mistakenly answered my phone not thinking and got a customer <laughs> that, you know, those take a long time to get resolved. So you have, so we have a professional team uh, that goes through those and resolves them. And, um, but for me, what was useful was you see patterns and you go, okay, this is what's not going well. This is consistent. We're just... It may not be numerically that, you know, percentage-wise that yeah. high, but if somebody is taking time out of their day to email the CEO saying this is screwed up, yeah, it's worth listening to. And then associates also knew my email, and they'd send me, you know, hey, this isn't going well. You got to fix this. You got to fix that. Whatever. What? What? Are, what? Uh, what are some of your favorite interactions, or, or better put? lessons learned, tidbits of wisdom received from Bernie Marcus? You said you'd learned a lot. Wow, a lot. So are there any that come to a mind? Uh, uh, it could be anything. Where yeah. you're like, wow, that's really useful. Uh, or, um, the, the first is, uh, just as I said about avoiding the echo chamber, getting outside of the echo chamber, uh, Bernie uh, has a great 
I think one of the things that makes Home Depot such a strong culture is that one of Bernie's other early on comments to me was, um, look, you have a prominent job, but you don't have a significant job. <laughs> you have a prominent job because you go out and talk to analysts and all the rest of it, but the only significant jobs are the jobs of the people who are helping customers. And so everything you do, and that again, it goes back to the inverted pyramid, everything you do is in support of your frontline associates and your customers. And that's how you have to think about the orientation of, of your business. Bernie, also the quote unquote headquarters in Home Depot is not called the headquarters. Uh, it's called the store support center. That's not that unusual in retail, but it's a real, the idea is you're there to support the store. Hmm. That's what you're there to do. What are some of the other ingredients? Those could be pre-existing, so before before you arrived, or uh, changes that you and your team helped to to make uh, that helped foster the orange apron cult. That sort of that dedication to customer yeah. service, uh, because it seems, at least based on what I'd read, that you you really paid a lot of attention to. I'm not going to say resurrecting it, but really reinforcing yeah. that as a core differentiator. Uh. So it goes through, I mean, I, it starts with, um, and again, this is, this is another Bernieism, but uh, you, you, you need to take care of your associates. And so uh, even when things were really tough in the housing downturn, we were giving our hourly associates pay raises and bonuses when we weren't in the, in the store support center. We pay our assistant store managers get stock grants, um, which I don't think any other retailer anywhere near the Home Depot size. And now those stock grants, you know, I, those are worth a lot of money. Uh, so getting them bought into and understanding that the success of the company is their success as well. Also on pay, we, uh, we have a very we instituted a very strong success sharing program. So, you know, if your store does well, the associates get an extra bonus. Um, all of those things to say, look, I can't expect an associate to care about paying attention to the customer if the company isn't caring about the associate. Uh, we did lots of other programs and then a lot on the recognition and uh, reward side to reinforce the culture of the company. But you do actually have to focus on how you pay people too. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only so much you can do without addressing, you, you've got to be creating opportunities for wealth generation for your team. And that's what's got to be, as I said, that's what's got to be exciting to you and what's got to be driving. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the bullets that was suggested to me as a point to explore with you. It's in fact, the number one that was suggested by this friend of mine <clears throat> is accountability. And uh, this is what he wrote. Every time something went wrong, he took responsibility. Even right before he left Home Depot and a trend, uh, even right before he left Home Depot and a transition plan was set up, there was a, there was a security breach. It was 56 million credit card numbers or so. And Frank took the blame also fixed things fast. He has, uncanny self-awareness. Quite separately, I had wanted to chat about this. So the incident response room that was set up on the 20th floor of Home Depot, not headquarters, the uh, store support right. side. Store support side. Uh, yeah. How did you handle that crisis? What was your thinking process? Can you just take us through that? Because uh, I, I really like to kind of explore the macro by digging into the micro. So sure. maybe we can talk about this. Uh, so Home Depot, we had a data breach in um, September of 2014 uh, in the sort of ironic uh, commentary. In August, we had actually spent a half a day going through with our board why we thought we were in pretty good shape and weren't going to have a data breach, but uh, obviously, obviously we did. Uh, we had a couple of... Um, so once we knew, uh, we and went out and made a public announcement right away. Uh, and my principles were, and I don't, I've, 
I, I think there was a very nice article written on, hey, you accepted accountability for this. Mm -hmm. I, another way to look at it is, well, I mean, really, <laughs> you, you, there wasn't, I mean, you had to. I mean, I, that wasn't the, not a serious choice. Uh, and understand, and this is where it actually helped being a lawyer, and understand that the help that the lawyers are going to give you is not help. Because the lawyers are going to say things like, well, don't admit that you did anything wrong because then you're going to be subject to litigation and all the rest. And you've got to understand that actually all that matters is taking care of your customers. So I actually gave the pen. I said, nothing is going to be written about what we do here from our legal team. Love our legal team. We are great lawyers, but it's all going to be written by our person in charge of communications. And all we're going to talk about is, as a customer, you're not liable, and here's what we're doing for you. And then we just decided we were going to be completely transparent. So every time we knew something, we said something, it was really painful because the nature of these things is that you don't really know what's going on. It unfolds over time. And so we'd have one release after another. It felt like we were constantly uh, in the barrel. But I think uh, people appreciated that we were being transparent and focused on taking care of our customer. And we didn't really see any significant decline. Was that uh, a difficult or an easy conversation to have in terms of how you were choosing to respond? Do you remember like sitting down and having that first conversation uh, or ever any of those i i do we set out here are our, here are our three principles the only thing that matters is how we communicate to the customers the second thing is i would tell people just recognize the second principle is recognize no one is going to say massive data breach at home depot everybody did things right so understand we screwed up don't worry about that worry about fixing it and I was really pleased, and I give a lot of credit to our CIO at the time, Matt Carey. I was really pleased that the experts who kind of came in and cleaned up the situation uh, said that they saw less finger-pointing CYA activity with Home Depot than anybody else. Uh, so it was, hey, let's just move forward and get this thing fixed. Um, and uh, we, we got through it. It wasn't... Uh, I mean, I, there wasn't a lot of discussion about weighing other alternative approaches. I was very fortunate because my board was entirely supportive of how we handled it. Um, so I would imagine having the legal credentials that you do also helps because you can yeah. think about it from the perspective right. of a general counsel, but yeah. make the executive decision to do something different. Exactly. And know that in the end, the value gained from that is modest in terms of the value potentially lost by not being straightforward with, with your customers. You, and frankly, our lawyer was 110% behind that too. You mentioned three principles. Could you review them for us? Yeah. So it's, it was customers first, no CYA and fix the problem. Okay. So recognize is related to, uh, problem solving, right? It's like, don't, right. don't try to spin the facts. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what, were there any decisions that, that, that stick out for you as far as uh, the, the most difficult or one of the more difficult decisions, conversations you've had to, you had to have uh, during your tenure at, at Home Depot? Are there any particular difficult periods? Because looking at your resume, it's, uh, I can imagine quite a few people think to themselves, my God, this guy just bats a thousand every time he steps up to the plate uh, and find it very intimidating. Uh, I think with, with, with some uh, uh, you know, understanding, but uh, any particular difficult times, it doesn't have to be at Home Depot, in fact. I mean, another question I like to ask, and if this is uh, an easier way to go about it. It could be throughout any, at any point yeah. in your career, but a favorite failure. And what I mean by that is a failure that in some way set you up for later success. Uh, is, are there any examples, difficult times, difficult decisions, or uh, failures that ended up being for the better? 
So it's, it's uh, an embarrassing failure, but I'll give a failure that was a great wake up for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so before I became CEO, one of the things I did for Home Depot is I did our real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned, my son worked at the company, still works at the company, but at the time had just come back from Iraq and was starting working in a store in Depot and was given, uh, I think, a temporary store assistance manager or a store manager, I can't remember exactly which, out in Colorado Springs. So I fly out there to see him, and he's there with four or five of his colleagues from who'd also just returned from Iraq, and they're telling the stories. And I thought I worried about it as a parent, but at the end of it, I was just kind of overwhelmed by, wow, I didn't worry nearly enough. And these... <laughs> And, and these people are just profoundly heroic. So that was the dinner. Then in the morning, I say, great, Frank, I'm going to drive out and see your store. And brand new store. So it was a store I was responsible for, brand new store. And he, great, here's the address. And so I'm driving out to the store. I drive down, and I don't see it. I kind of go three miles up. Don't see it. Three miles back, don't see it. Do it again, do it again. Finally, I see it, and the store is hidden by this massive berm along the roadway, and there's this tiny little sign saying Home Depot. And then the store itself, uh, you know, if you know the construction of the store, the store has beams where they shouldn't be. I mean, it was just... <laughs> and I go, this was my job. It was one, we were doing 200 stores a year at the time. Wow. This was my job. This was a number. Mm -hmm. I was just getting a number out to check my box. And this is my son's damn store. That's heartbreaking. And my commentary to myself was personalize this. Make this personal. Feel it's personal. Your son may not be doing every job, but pretend that there's somebody, you know, there's, there are people at the end of these decisions and focus on that and don't check a number box. A, a, as I say, not a, not a happy mistake, uh, failure, but clearly a failure and, and one um, hopefully, hopefully I'll learn from. So the, the, the word worry or worrying has come up quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And it strikes me that perhaps there are different species of worrying in the sense that uh, there's maybe passive worrying where something just eats at you and eats at you. And it's, as I heard someone say to me once, uh, worrying is praying for what you don't want. Uh, it, but, and then perhaps there are other forms of worrying that are more active. So when something is bothering at you, bothering you or you see a potential risk, what is the thought process or the, the next steps for you? What, what, how do you then take it out of your head so it's not just acid in the vessel yeah. and do something with it? Yeah. And, I, and any examples? Well, so there are different parts of worrying. And yeah. just as you said, Tim, there are lots of different ways of worrying. <laughs> On a personal level, I, you know, I always found I'd just take the worry to, okay, here are a series of things that can go wrong. Every single thing goes wrong. And I mean, you could ask my kids, I joke, I always figured I'd end up driving a taxi or an Uber now. Mm -hmm. Just follow it all through and you're driving a taxi and, eh, you know, that's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And just deal with it that way. Uh, the more constructive worrying is uh, when you when you actually try to break it down and say, okay, what am I worried about? What, and, and typically the answer to that is take the worry from the generic and move it to some level of ground engagement. Go check it out. Mm -hmm. Go check it out. Go figure out what's actually happening. Odds are you'll be less worried. And even if you're not less worried, odds are you'll actually have an answer to how to deal with your worries. So step number one is fact finding. Yeah. Or, yeah. All right. So... Uh, I read a great book many years ago. So this is another book that has traveled with me. Yeah. One of the others. So along with 
uh, the story of Home Depot, uh, there's one called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by oh, Dale wow. Carnegie. Okay. And wow. That sounds like a profound it's, book. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a fantastic book. Yeah. And one of the first steps is is this fact finding. Right. right. Like, don't assume that your worry is well founded. Right. Don't assume you figured it out. Right. Uh, go do some fact finding. Um, after you've done that, whether you're, let's say you, perhaps you're less worried, perhaps you're more worried, but still worried nonetheless. All right. This is a legitimate right. risk. What do you do then? Uh, so if you ask the people who work for me at Home Depot, and they sometimes joke about this, that I just would do anxiety transfer. <laughs> I, I just go, okay, hey, here's my observation. This isn't going well. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. You go. And I think, anxiety transfer. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, and that is my view of careers. Careers exist. People People progress in their lives through solving bigger and bigger problems. So mm -hmm. you go, here, here's a problem. Here's, here's what I see. Here's a developmental opportunity here's for you. Here's a developmental opportunity. See if you can go <laughs> fix this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was wondering, as you said it, what anxiety transfer would mean. A friend of mine, uh, and he's a humorist, also a fantastic writer named A.J. Jacobs. He writes for Esquire, mm. among many other things that he yeah. does. And at one point, he was experimenting with outsourcing to India, the Philippines, and so on. And uh, he was trying to broaden the number of tasks that he could delegate to someone else, keeping in mind that this is all a bit tongue in cheek. And one of the things he did, because he is a, a real worrier, uh, and he decided to outsource his worrying. So whether it was a book deadline or something else, he would <laughs> ask great. someone in Bangalore <laughs> right. to worry about it for <laughs> him. I and, love that. And he told me, he said, it actually worked. Right. I it actually, just to know that someone was that's worrying brilliant. about it on my behalf. I, I love that. I love that. That's <laughs> terrific. Outsource the worry. <laughs> yes. Uh, I like that. What, if, if, what advice did you give to your successor at Home Depot was there, did you have sort of a presidential meeting? Like, let me tell you a few things that I've learned in the trenches, a few things to keep in mind. Did you, did you have that conversation? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure we did, but I'm sure he also didn't need it. And <laughs> <laughs> but let's say someone, let's say that it were someone coming in fresh, right? So they, they didn't have the experience with Home Depot. What advice might you have given them uh, aside from, what we've discussed so far. Is yeah. there anything you would add on, on top uh, of that? I think it's, it's um, listening and com how important listening, communicating, and getting your whatever it is you want as simply stated as possible. I'm, uh, so this is the other part of the legal side is, uh, and I can't remember who said it, but there is, what you always want to get to is simplicity that's on the other side of complexity. Mm -hmm. That's the goal for whatever it is you're working on. And when you get there, you know you've got it and you know you really understand it. Um, and whenever you find yourself just bound up in complexity, you just know you haven't worked it hard enough. Mm -hmm. How did you, you had uh, mentioned the simple and portable messaging yeah. earlier. How would you suggest someone develop that skill? Or how did you develop that skill? Think about stories, I think, mm -hmm. is, the, is the way to start. I mean, uh, listening to your podcast, listening to how you tease out things from people, it's, in the end, you remember stories. And so mm -hmm. if you said, this is where I'm trying to go, and this is the story around it, mm -hmm. uh, you can get pretty simple, portable messages. Um, mm -hmm. Slogans don't do it. It's much, much better if you can say, here's the story. Here's what it, here's what it looks like, because mm -hmm. people respond to the stories. Do you remember any stories that you've told that have had a particularly large impact or that you've just received a lot of positive feedback uh, about? Uh, and, it, and it brings it harkens back to you talking about reading these passages uh, in your, your very first sort of address right. to the troops. But are, are there any other moments that come to mind? Could be one-on-one, -on -one, could be with a smaller group, could be with the entire base of associates. So it's Home Depot related or more broadly? A anything. All right. So anything. Uh, so one of the fun things they're doing uh, post-Home Depot is a, is a podcast 
listening to yours and go, gosh, these podcasts are fascinating. So we do something called Crazy Good Turns that talks about people who do crazy good things for others. And there are great, I, I love it for lots of different reasons, but here's the story. So we've been doing it for three years and there's one human story, all of the stories are wonderful, but there's one in particular that I particularly love. There's a woman, uh, she happens to live in Atlanta. She's now around 70 years old. When she was three years old, and she describes very poor circumstances, and you know, her mom leaves her in the apartment and goes across the street to get groceries. She's in the apartment with her sister. She's playing on the sofa. She finds some matches down the cushion. She lights them. She's wearing cotton pajamas, and she goes up like a match. She's entirely on fire. Raced to the hospital, third degree burns covering most of her body. And again, this is now 65, 67 years ago. Massive blood transfusions required skin grafts. Uh, they put out an all point bulletin on a need for blood. A truck driver driving through the town hears this, stops, donates blood, and donates skin. And Ooh, apparently wow. a skin graft is like one of the most painful operations ever. Oh, I can imagine. Gets into his truck and drives on. And you go, I go, if that's not the best, I, if that's not the best story ever of people doing something for someone else and then, mm -hmm. I mean, just, so that's my favorite, favorite story. You mentioned uh, so post, post Home Depot. So what, what are you uh, focused on these days? Uh, what types of projects are keeping you, yeah. keeping your mind occupied? Uh, so, the, so this Crazy Good Turns podcast, I uh, have a, a lot of fun with, I don't do most of the work on that. Uh, the co-founder with me, Bradshaw, does the real work. Um, and we work together at Home Depot, and it goes to the message and the story. And what Brad did at Home Depot was a lot of that storytelling mm -hmm. of how you get these messages that are portable that people understand. Was he in comms, or was he in exactly? Yeah. He was head. He was uh, head of our corporate communications, <clears throat> and did just a phenomenal job. And so we have great fun working on this podcast. Uh, and then the, uh, when I started retirement, I had this elegant theory, or I thought it was elegant. I said, I got to spend a third of my time on business stuff, a third of my time on personal stuff, and then a third of my time giving back. And that actually is, turns out to be sort of a useless way to think about it. Uh, and, <laughs> why, why, and, why is that? Well, um, it's sort of choppy and it's not continuous enough and um it struck me recently so in november i got to spend a day this is an interesting story in itself but i got to spend a day traveling around with ken langone who ken is one of the co-founders of home depot he was my lead director at the start of home depot and he's just one of life's phenomenal people and i realized at the end of it that really what I want to learn is I, I, I want to figure out how to be authentically generous. And whatever it is I'm doing, I mean, I've, some people pay me for help, some people don't pay me for help. People who pay me for help are probably frustrated by it, but uh, it's generosity. How do I, so putting that piece together with Welch's final advice and how do you learn to do that? And it doesn't, it's not something that comes naturally to me uh, I'm not the kind of person who, you know, you see the beggar on the street and I reach in my pocket and give a buck. I'm much more the kind of person who's going, oh, that's not really going to help him for the following reason. Um, but that's my, so that's what I'm working on. I'm trying to figure out how to be more genuinely helpful and generous. How are you working on it? Uh, so, um, because it seems like just like with worry, you have subsets yeah. of worry. There are many different ways to be generous, and it, it might mean different things to different people. Yeah, so, exactly. So how are how yeah. are you working on? Yeah. It? So so and I don't and I'm way short. Yeah. Right. Way 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 short. 
Uh, but I know if you kind of work right to left and you go, what do I want people to say? I'd love them to say that, at, mm -hmm. you know, whenever. Uh, so, so there are small things um, in terms of uh, just giving. I mean, money, giving money is one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, trying to be helpful when you do it so that it's not just writing a check and it actually takes a lot of thought. I've learned this. You know, I get to hang around a fair amount with Ken and with Bernie. And Bernie now, what he does is his foundation. That's what Ken does. How you think about doing that and how you actually think about being helpful to people as you're generous with your own resources, um, it's learning. And I can tell there are some things I do where I think I'm being helpful, where people go, God, that's fascinating, but keep your help to yourself. And other things I do <laughs> where, where I think I'm, I'm a little more successful on. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where do you think, what falls in the latter category? Of uh, particularly people who are starting things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for whatever reason in dealing with their own anxiety, uh, find it helpful to talk to somebody else who's got some perspective and can help them feel uh, like they're making progress on whatever direction they're, they're going. Um, and I think one of the great things that's true now that wasn't true you know, when I was growing up is that people are actually really willing to take some risks mm -hmm. and do things and start their own businesses and start their own charities and uh, step out. And that's phenomenal. And helping that is great. So there, there are probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of entrepreneurs listening to this. And I'd love to go to some of my, my well-worn rapid fire questions, but I, I might tweak it a little bit. So I very often ask about the most gifted books or most reread, which I'll probably ask anyway, but we're going to back into that by asking, uh, if, are there any particular books you would recommend? If you could recommend say two or three books could be more to an entrepreneur, maybe they're a year into their business or in the early stages, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be early stages. I'm, I know I'm adding a lot of qualifiers here, but what, what books might you recommend to them? Uh, so we talked about one of them built from scratch, I yeah. think is, uh, is just a great book. It's yeah. and any entrepreneur, uh, should read it saying this, not because I'm on this podcast, but because I started listening to your podcast and I think your books are phenomenal. Thank and you. I think, uh, What's great about them is uh, that, that you make an effort to kind of pull out from people, here's what I think is, you know, kind of a core part of what makes whatever it is I do successful. And as a reader or as a listener, I can kind of choose. I can say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Or no, boy, that person's just way, <laughs> way, way doing something different. And I don't believe... Uh, I don't believe that there's any one particular, you know, I, as a business person, I love Jim Collins' is good, you know, good to great. But you can also look at that and go, oh, this is fascinating because the companies that were originally right. good to great are now not so great, <laughs> not even existing. So, uh, so you have to be willing to understand that there are lots of different stories and then you find your own within that. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, so I give your book um, because I think it's I think it's very cool. I think it's I think it's much more. Uh, people have to have more respect for differences and right. different ways of approaching problems. There's no one path. No one path. Are there any books besides uh, built uh, from scratch that you've gifted a lot to other people or reread a lot yourself? So the book I tend to gift people is not has nothing to do with uh um business it's a book by a writer called clive james and it's called cultural amnesia mm -hmm. and uh first off he writes uh he, he is so learned that uh you just want to read what he has to say so he's and i assume he's not making this up but you know he says well you know i wanted to read proust 
but I didn't know French, so I started with the LaRousse and start learning French. And you go, okay, anybody who can do that, I'm interested in what he has to say. But the book is interesting because it talks about, uh, to me it's interesting because it talks about how World War II and the guilt around World War II, particularly in Europe, infected the all of the sort of liberal arts world mm -hmm. and the unwillingness to actually face into uh, the fact that there was more collaboration than people wanted to admit. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes the people that were truly heroic are, actual, are actually uh, heavily criticized because the people who were less than heroic couldn't stand the comparisons. And mm. you go through all of these different literary figures and you go, whoa, didn't know that backstory. That's pretty interesting. So is cultural amnesia, is it a collection of yes. examples and yes. narratives yes. related to, I'm just trying to make sure he goes I'm through clear. Different, different authors. And, and, he, and these are people who are chopped down by their contemporaries because yes. of yeah. their success. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. And, and, or v venerated now, right. but no one really sees through to, hey, maybe, maybe there's, there are more feet of clay than we want to say. It makes me think of, uh, that sounds fantastic. I, I want to check that out. Because, and then do you give that to people? Well, let, uh, let me spit out what it was on top of my brain, which was, it reminds me of a quote from Francis Ford Coppola when he was being interviewed by uh, a friend of mine, Robert Rodriguez, who's here in Austin, filmmaker. And uh, I think it was during this interview that he said, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, of course, Francis Ford Coppola, one of the greats. Right. And he said, the, the same things that get you fired when you're younger are the things they give you lifetime achievement awards for when you're older, <laughs> which I thought was yeah, great a, a keen observation. Great uh, do, you give this to, do you give this to people to embolden them, to give them courage to do things with the expectation of facing that type of blowback? Or why do you give this book? Uh, I, I give it first because uh, when he talks, so the cultural amnesia is the subtext of what he's talking about, but he also just is such a great observer of different writers, and uh, it makes you want to read all of the source material right. that he's writing about. So if you like, reading books and I like reading books it's one of those books that first as I say you go this may be the smartest human being who's ever put pen to paper and um, he's just brilliantly smart and secondly that's an interesting way to look at history and how history has impacted things but it's more just do you love books and do you love these these authors uh, are there any books that you've finished recently or that you're reading currently so the book that I just finished recently, I, I, heart, it's not a full-fledged book, so it's real short, 300 Arguments by Sarah Mongusso. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a neat book because her objective is I'm going to reduce this book to the 300 things that you'd underline if I wrote a real book. <laughs> and so it's got a lot of little... It's, it's a, sh I mean, you could read it in less than an hour, uh, but it's got a really, it's, it's kind of like Montaigne. It's like mm -hmm. um, little statements. L lots of aphorisms. Fun. Little aphorisms. What's the know? theme of the book? Or Great question. And if I were a deeper reader, I'd probably <laughs> be able to tell you the theme. And I'm, I'm probably doing her book massive injustice by not knowing what the theme is. Mm -hmm. To me, it was sort of a random... Oh, it's a very of, eclectic yeah, mix. I mean, it just bounces, bounces around with different observations, some of which you go, God, that's brilliant. And some of them, yeah. But how, do you, how did you choose that book? And I guess the broader question is, how do you choose books? Because we, yeah. all, we all have finite time on this planet. Yeah. How, did, how do you go about choosing books? So on that one, uh, and I can't remember how, what the path was that got me. There's a guy who writes a blog, Austin Cleon. And he's, yeah, yeah, Austin Cleon. All right. Also an Austinite. He's also here. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So I don't know quite why I got to Steal his Like book. an Artist, I think, is one of his books. Yeah. He has a number. So mm -hmm. I... So 
I start reading his blog, and he talks about, and he had something that said, here are the 15 best books I read in 2017. Huh. And I go, done. I'm going to read the 15, and that was one of the books. He had some others, and I'm going through them. I'm going oh, to make, that's go amazing. through all 15. Well, Austin. Yeah. Good work, sir. Yeah. Uh, this the next question is very much a left turn. Uh, <laughs> And it's it's a hit or miss question. Yeah. So if if it's if it's a a flub on my side, we can we can skip it. But what is the purchase of a hundred dollars or less? Could be a thousand dollars or less. Whatever that comes to mind that has positively impacted your life in the last year or two. Does anything come to mind? So if I can bump it up above two hundred dollars, sure, it's shoes. All right. So, so recognize that I spent years walking concrete floors. Yeah. And, you know, as I was saying on my back thing, you know, shoes are just hugely important. So I got a, a shoe that I actually really like. What, and so, what is the shoe? So what is the Sam shoe? Hubbard shoes. Sam and, Hubbard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So to all me, right. finding a, so all my, all, for the last however many years, mm -hmm. I don't have the patience to actually get, you know, go through the right sizing. And so I never wear the right size <laughs> shoes. And uh, <laughs> it's just been an enormous frustration. <laughs> and I finally found a pair of shoes I really like. Sam Hubbard. Yeah. So uh, I, I'd big be, fan of shoes. Yeah. Well, I, I became fixated on shoes at one point because... Uh, as backstory, I'd been extremely stingy. Yeah, stingy sounds too Scrooge McDuck. Cheap. Right. Economical. Right. Uh, for all, my entire life, really. I mean, I was the guy who would have his, his girlfriend complain about the single ply toilet paper and be like, really, <laughs> really, Tim? Like, can we just get two ply? This is terrible. That's great. And uh, I would always buy the cheapest shoes that seemed comfortable and were tolerable to yeah. my girlfriend uh, aesthetically. And at one point, I was in <clears throat> Panama talking to this wonderful woman, woman who is uh, the wife of uh, this gent who at one point had owned the largest uh, brewery in Panama, maybe Central America, and a uh, really wise woman. And she said to me, you know, Tim, because she was looking at my shoes and I just had nothing appropriate for Panama. And she said, there are two places you should really spend money. She said, if necessary, your mattress and your Amen. shoes, because yep. if you're not in yep. one, you're going to be in the yep. other. And yep. I was like, that's Whoa. great advice. So that is phenomenal advice. Yeah. So the Sam Humbert, I mean, I, yeah. I, I really pay attention to the shoes now because, uh, well, I should say what contributed to that or reinforced it was my experience in writing about cooking and you have line cooks yeah. who are standing all, all day, day long, long. prep. Yeah. I mean, they're standing right. all day, day and they, yeah. a lot of them wear shoes designed for hospital use for their, these slip on right. shoes that are used by nurses and doctors. Fantastic. All right. Well, I have, I have a shoe yeah. type to check yeah. out. Uh, if you were to teach a class to, let's call it high school seniors or college students, you could, you could pick the grade and actually you could pick any grade. What class would you teach and why? Uh, history. History. I, just because history is about people. Uh, history, we learn so much from history. I'd, I'd love teaching history. What I would, wasn't a great history student, but after, you know, when you think about what books are fun to read, it's great to read history books. And so. Any particular focus? What would the course description look like? Uh, I, I, I like American history. I'm not that familiar with, you know, I haven't mm -hmm. spent enough time to know the history of other mm -hmm. countries, but I think our history is, is unbelievably complex and fascinating. Is there, um, I've been going through the Oxford uh, History of the United States, sort of book by book, um, and they get maybe more <laughs> deeply in than I might want to, but it's fascinating. It's great. Is there any particular historical figure from U.S. history? And that was a little department of redundancy department, but that's okay. Is there any historical figure in the U.S. Y you would particularly have liked to meet or have dinner with? Does anyone anyone come to mind? Uh, I I um, 
Boy, there's so there's so many, right? You, you could there's list so, you could list more than you one. Could, you could you could uh, have a lot of a lot of fascinating a lot of fascinating people. I'd actually Truman is of Truman would be interesting and Eisenhower would be interesting. I think both of those characters, uh, you know, for the decisions they faced, and obviously Eisenhower, uh, you know, I think we so he was the president that I grew up with, and so much deeper than any picture that we have of him. That would be interesting. Eisenhower gets used a lot as an example by Peter Drucker yeah, as an effective as an effective executive. I believe it. I, the military has so much uh, have has so many great learnings on leadership. A lot to be borrowed. A lot, a lot, a lot to, to be, be borrowed, borrowed there for yeah. sure. All right, last last few questions. Yeah. <clears throat> If you could put anything on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, so yeah. a word, a sentence, a quote could be yours or someone else's, to get out to millions or billions of people, what might you put on that? Uh, the, it would be uh, the only blessings you own are the ones you share. Oh, I and, love that. Um, that's, you know, that's the most fun thing about this Crazy Good Turns thing is seeing the people who live that every day who are seeing things, um, seeing plights, people in need that others, I mean, there's a great one, I could go on and on about this, but there's a great story of who knew that there were homeless people living in tunnels under Las Vegas? Yeah. And then here's a guy who recognizes this and goes and takes care of the homeless people in tunnels in Las Vegas. And you go, wow, that's amazing. Got to, more of that, please. Um, so. So That's crazy it. good turns. Yeah. If you wanted to get someone hooked on crazy good turns, are there one or two episodes that you might suggest they start with? Uh, I I would start at the start. Um, so <laughs> Team Rubicon, we did an early one on Team Rubicon, which is the group of Iraqi and uh, Afghan uh, war veterans who come back, and you know people are probably familiar with them. They use their military training to go, you know, if there's a flood, they go and address the flood. And amazing, it's an amazing uh, group uh, early on. I mean, they're all, I love, you know, it's like kids. Which, which are your favorite kids? Yeah. I just, so that's the first one. But every single one of them. And then I think the second one we did was uh, um, about tunnel to tower, tunnels to tower. You know the story of the the guy who was the fireman on his day off, and uh, the twin towers are hit, and he's driving in to help his uh, fire. You know his colleagues, and the tunnel is back, backed up, and so he puts all his gear and runs through the tunnel to the towers, and unfortunately died. And you know then there's now a um, uh, a run every year through the tower in commemoration of that. But, you know, just people are... So I'd, I'd start with the start and the first ones, but I love them all. They're, as I say, it's like choosing among kids. Why did you create it or why did you co-create it? What's, why put it's, this into the world? I mean, I, I know it takes effort. It, uh, it's the... So if... if um, when we started... It was, and my first comment to Brad Shaw, the guy who does it with me, was, is that I, if eight people listen to this, I'll be thrilled because I just want to take someone who's done amazing things and talk about them mm -hmm. and just have them have a notion that someone's going to spend, you know, ours are short, you know, 25 minutes, 25 minutes talking about the great thing they do. And then Brad did such a good job of it that now we're saying, okay, we want people to listen to it. But it's, it's, um, it goes back to the concept of celebrating. Whatever it is you want, celebrate. Highlight and it. highlight it and tell stories about it. And uh, we connect from hearing these stories. And sometimes you go, wow, this person's just so much better person than I'm ever going to be. That Forget it. That's out of the ballpark. But it's still inspirational. And then some of them you go, oh, yeah, OK. I, I, can, I can do that. Maybe I'll correct course one degree. Right. Yeah, yeah. So for all of you who complain that my interviews are too long, uh, I mean, certainly many of you listen to the entire interview, but if you'd like a short form fix, you should check out Crazy Good Turns. And I'm going to make, I don't do this very much, but I'm going to make an ask of the audience. And then I'm going to ask you if you have any 
parting words, suggestions, advice, or asks of the audience. Uh, so beyond checking out Crazy Good Turns, I would challenge everyone listening for a day, maybe a week, to not criticize. So to, to try to put into practice what we've been talking about, and that is highlighting and applauding what it is you want to see more of in the world. If you, if you see someone online who's doing something great, who's making sacrifices for the, better, for the greater good, practice applauding that. Because if you do criticize, and the criticism online is certainly 99% of what we see, but you, practice makes perfect even if the practice isn't a good practice. So if you, if you focus on being critical, you'll get better at it, and it'll become easier. So for a day, for a week, try to focus on applauding what it is you want to see more of out in the world. So that would be my, my challenge, my suggestion to everybody uh, who is listening to this. And I will do the same for myself. I will, I will eat my own dog food on that one. Uh, so, uh, any, any parting words? Well, that's uh, brilliant. I'm not, I'm not going to begin to improve on that. <laughs> that is brilliant. And it is, um, so true. It's so true. If, if you take time to recognize and appreciate other people, uh, it bounces back. It gives back. So and, very uh, cool. Perfect. Well, <laughs> sorry to go first. But, no. But, no, I, but I, I wanted to get that out so because well I, I feel so, so strongly well about it. There's, yeah. there's, there's so much negativity out the world, out in the world. You and I, none of us have to create more of it. There's a surplus of negativity. So try to focus on increasing the positivity. And uh, you don't get the positive just by shutting down the negative. That void doesn't fill itself. Uh, where can people learn more about you, find you online, if, if, if there is any way that you would like to share? And of course, everyone who is listening to this, you can find the show notes with links to everything, including crazy good turns and so on at tim.blog forward slash podcast. But is there, uh, are there any other places people can say, say hello or learn more about what you're up to? Uh, at Frank Blake on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, that's probably the dominant in addition to the crazy good turns. Fantastic. Well, Frank, thank you so oh, much for your time. What a treat. Thank yeah, you. This was a lot thank of fun. You. And uh, for everyone out there on the interwebs, wherever you may be, as always, thank you for listening. Talk to you next time.